Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and next to me, the export director for, I think, I think one of the more interesting domains uh, in, in Burgundy working today. Uh, domain de la Vougeray? Yep. Is that, did I say that right? You said that perfectly. Okay, good. Because my French isn't, you know, American. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, what we're going to talk about here today is not only about Vougeray, but a little bit about uh, the, the folks behind Vougeray. Um, because it's, it, it's not so simple. Huh? Is, is it, is it, is it, is there, is there a complicated story to the Boisset family in Vougeray, or? Gosh, well, the whole story of the Boisset family starts, is, is involved with Vougeau. Mm -hmm. So, to put the story in a, in a nutshell, um, Boisset, which, as a sum of all of its parts, is the largest producer of wine in Burgundy, started in 1961, when Jean-Claude Boisset and his wife Claudine had one barrel of Gevre Chambertin. And you know, 60 years later, they are the head of the third largest wine family in France and the largest producer of Burgundy. But we're not big like one winery with millions of gallons of tanks and, and, and millions of labels. We're the big because of a lot of us, some of small parts. Parceled out. Absolutely. We have, we have 23 different um, uh, wine making uh, facilities, wineries uh, in France and in California. Mm -hmm. um, you know, each with their own dedicated vineyards, each with their own dedicated winemakers. Uh, winemakers you'll be speaking to later from, from Chablis, Burgundy, Beaujolais, and also in the Rhone Valley in the south of France. And uh, John Charles Boisset, of course, uh, who came to the United States about 25 years ago, um, acquired some of the major domains in California as well. Mm -hmm. So to come back to, to Boisset, it was a, a, you know, a period of acquiring uh, some of France's oldest and most iconic properties and restoring them to their former historical glories. And over that 50-year period, as he acquired wineries, of course, he acquired parcels of land with mm. those wineries mm -hmm. and for most of the time originally the, the those parcels of land remained attached to the wineries that bought and were sold as part of those individual uh, demands right and then in 1999 um, he decided that he John Charles and, uh, and Natalie his sister had a vision that you know maybe they could collect all those parcels under a single umbrella and create one of Burgundy's iconic demands as you know mm. Burgundy has kind of a royal family of the Domaine de Lourdes Contes and the Bise Loires and you know, we said, you know, how about if we could be part of that constellation of unique domains, which is easier said than done. But I was going to say, uh, I mean, by, by French, by, or by Burgundy, by French stand, it's a meteoric rise. Absolutely. So from, from, from really just a collect, collection uh, um, of, of eclectic parcels in 1999 today to if you were to read any of the any of the world's wine critics on these wines, they're extremely collectible and, and high, highly uh, rated. But they really had a, a focused plan. They uh, and let's be, let's be honest about it. Some serious investment. Yep. Re real estate does not come cheap in Burgundy. We're not just doing this for money. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know the the domain when it was originally founded was something like twenty five hectares, and today it's over forty four. So you know over a hundred uh, over a hundred acres of prime vineyards prime. in Burgundy, yeah. including the Grand Cru's uh, in Mousigny, in Batamorachet, Courton Charlemagne, Courton. Uh, Charm Chambertin, um, in fact, uh, uh, a total of uh, almost 70 different parcels uh, covering uh, 44 hectares, including four monopolies. Right. So, but, but on average, you're talking about like backyard size parcels, many of these parcels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you to look, for example, on, on the front, every, every single label has the, the amount of, of wine produced on them. Here we have the, the Clos Blanc. Well, this is a big Bougeau. one, though. So this, this is, is big, the exception to the rule. That's massive 12,000 bottles. That's, yeah. a massive, <laughs> that's a massive thousand cases. But quite often we, we, we make uh, literally uh, a few hundred bottles of, of, some, of, the, of, of some of the smaller uh, appellations we make. There's a great story. If you go to the, if you go to the, the winemaking facility, one of the great things they have is they have individual oak fermenters that are dimensioned to the size of the individual parcels. Oh, jeez. So in handcrafted, hand-built oak fermenters, thermoregulated, and each one is different size depending on how big the parcel that they're vinifying is. So we were there two years ago, and Sylvie Poyot, who's the registrar of the domain, walked us past this mini little fermenter. The seriously, itty bitty fermenter. <laughs> seriously, about this high. And she says, oh, that's for the three R's. So, yeah, you know, nothing. Three, yeah. three rows of vines that Mr. Boisset just bought us in Vaughan de la Romaine. So, in Vaughan, in Vaughan Romaine. Yeah. So, yeah, quite, quite, quite extraordinary, yeah. <laughs> it's like a sparkless bottle size fermenter. <laughs> yeah. What is this? A center for ants! <laughs> but a couple of things you have to say about how, how did we get them. I mean, from, from day one, it's interesting to, you know, to, to point out that um, these wines uh, have always been 
not only organically but biodynamically farmed. Mm. Every single part mm. of, of the vineyard is organic. The many you guys got a hold of them. Absolutely. So yeah. it take, took three years. You have to take three years to get the certification. But now the, the whole domain yep. Yep. Is, is is certified as, as as biodynamic, and you know they have their own they have their own herb gardens where they grow their own. Um, Plants to make the you know the the tisans that they use in, instead of insecticides and, mm -hmm. and herbicides. Nothing's left to a chance in this domain. They actually have their own parcel of forest in the forest of Cito. Mm -hmm. Now, as you probably know, most of the French barrels come from the centre of France. They mm -hmm. come from mm -hmm. the, the forests of Allier and the sometimes in the Vosges, but Allier and, and Nevers. Um, but Domaine de Blougeray wanted to be as close as possible to what the Cistercian monks would have been doing when they first arrived in Burgundy. Uh, in the uh, in the late ten hundreds and the first harvest here were in the in the early twelfth century and of course they would have been using oak from the local forests so Mr Boisset bought them a parcel of forest in the Cito Abbey they harvest their own trees uh, and they have their own wood park at the winery where they where they dry the they where dry they the, stage, dry the wood drying the wood and then they they work with two or different coopers to to make Cito barrels so quite quite an extraordinary domain I honestly don't know if anyone else in Burgundy is rolling that way. I'm not aware of that. I've never no. heard of it. Yeah, not aware of that, but yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah, you'll be with us, I believe, <laughs> later, in the, later in the year, so you can come and see, you'll see the, the stacks of staves I, uh, in, the, in the backyard. It's that's be good. That's amazeballs. Now, are you using that wood for the current crop of wines? Is that something more recent that's uh, been incorporated? Or like, for example, are we, are we discovering that program in, in the wines, in the current vintage of wines? Or? Now, you'd have to excuse uh, uh, my ignorance to a certain extent of the... In how the individual cooperage on each of these individual wines. We don't use those uh, the Vujo oak on all of the wines, mostly on the reds, I believe. Mm -hmm, we're, mm -hmm. still, we're still obviously using, uh, especially on the whites, more of that, that tight white grained oak that you'll be getting from Allier. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Particularly, so um, it's not used on all of, all of the barrels, 100% uh, from, um, uh, from Cito, but we have been doing it for several years already, yeah. yeah. This is great. Mm. G getting back to Vujo and getting mm. back to the 12th century and getting back to old Burgundy, um, I want to talk a little bit about this wine. We have a, we have a few minutes left. Um, this is Vujo Premier Cru Blanc, and this is something you don't see every day. At least we don't see here in the States every day. Can you talk a little bit about this individual wine? Yeah, well, I mean, in many, I mean, we only have a few minutes, so in, yep. in many ways it's the history of Burgundy in a nutshell. I, li I, like, <laughs> I, li I like to say that. Well, why? Because first of all, here we're at the heart of, uh, of the origins of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. and as you probably know, wines have been made in Burgundy since Roman times. Yeah. And what I like to say, modern day, Burgundy, as we know, it is not that old because it only dates back to 1098. Right. <laughs> when the, only. Yeah, when the Cistercian monks arrived and built the Abbey of Cito mm -hmm. and were given a plot of land, which was Clos mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the surrounding vineyards, and started to systematically cultivate and understand that if you planted red vines in this parcel, it did better than Chardonnay. And yep. this, this plot produces fantastic wines and this is not so good. Right. And they were the first people. They were great scientists, horticulturists. Anything that's good and alcoholic in Europe is down yeah. to the monks, as, uh, as we know. And when they were cultivating the vines of, uh, of Vougeot, they noticed that one particular parcel had a higher, higher proportion of calcus limestone, white pebbles in the soil than the rest of it around it. And the general rule in Burgundy is the higher proportion of chalky white soil and, and, and limestone in the soil, the more conducive it is to growing great Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So this we call our diamond in a sea of rubies because <laughs> it's right next door to Clos Vougeot itself. Right. If you stand on the road and you look to your left in Clos Vougeot, you can see these heavy clay soils. Uh, they're on hard limestone rock, and this is where the great Pinots are grown in Clos Vougeot. If, if you come up the road and the chateau is right there, is it over on this side? It's right on the right, yeah. Right on the right, okay, if you yeah. look to your right, you can see the white soil, you can see the white stone. Yeah. So, it's, and, so they planted it with white wine, and the first harvest was in, in 1110. This, uh, this is Cistercian monks. <laughs> and um, the Cistercian monks wore white cassocks, uh -huh. and so red blood stains were unseemly. So this was the altar wines for the Abbey of Cito from 1110 to 1789 in the French... <laughs> Revolution. So yeah, we call it a diamond in the sea of rubies because it's one white. Actually, it's a it's a premier cru, but I mean, I think everybody yeah. agrees that's Grand Cru class white burgundy. White burgundy, yeah. Surrounded by Mousny, Echezeau, Clos Vougeot, the great red Grand Cru's of Burgundy, with this one little plot of absolutely fantastic Chardonnay planted where you wouldn't expect it. Yeah, so. I, I think it's one of the most unique wines of Burgundy, and I think it's um it, it's it's something that we don't see a lot of. And this particular parcel itself, the Clos Blanc. Yeah. Right, is yes. unique even within the context of that. Right, I mean, it's is is this the only white portion in in Vujo, or does someone else make? No, there are there are uh, one or two other producers. There's a, a part of the uh, Lecra, which is just mm -hmm. under the Clos, which is produced in white. 
Mr. Boisset's back garden, which is a little further down the hill, <laughs> is planted half with Chardonnay and half with Pinot Noir. It's called Pinot. Le Clos Prioré. Ah. So that's a monopoly, uh, monopoly holding uh, in, in Clos Bourgeois that's also producing white. And of course, you may know there's a little bit of Musigny Blanc yes. as well, yeah, which is famous, yeah, yeah. which would be in the, in the same, within the, within the general, general same area. So you do get a few very exceptional white wines in this area, but they're very rare and very few bottles produced. For all intents and purposes, one of the rarest white wines in Burgundy. Absolutely one of the uh, yeah. rarest white wines in Burgundy. Yeah. And unique because it's, it's where you would not expect to find it. As you know, I like to call, I like to call the Côte de Nuit Pinot Land. Mm. It's pretty much 90% Pinot Noir producing the whole right. of Côte de Nuit. White wine's very unusual, and especially one with such a great story and such great class. Neil, that's, uh, that's it. We're rolling. We're going to get out of here so we can let, these, uh, ne let, the, uh, let the folks move on to the next video. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks and for having this us. This was awesome. And thanks for bringing this. Uh, we really like talking about particular domains, unique domains, and some of the unique wines that they craft themselves. So this was really cool. Thank you very much. Cheers. Great. Cheers. All right.